Hi there folks, welcome back to the Ever and Andy Fishing Channel. It's Andy again and today I've got IB behind the camera because we're about to film what we think is probably the most requested topic we've ever had on the channel. You guys are really good, you keep in touch via the comments, you let us know what you want to see next and it's absolutely fantastic and I think this is almost certainly the one that comes up the most. We're talking about the very modern, very mysterious and in some cases very controversial French leader or Euro nymph in style. So this is the first video in what's going to be a two-part series. There's no way I can cram all this information into one video. So if you're not a subscriber and you think you're going to be interested in this series, hit the subscribe button now and make sure you keep in touch because the second video will be coming very soon. So I guess the first question about the French leader is, what is it? You know, what, what is this thing? Why is it different? And it is very, very different. Essentially, the French leader or Euro Nymphin, as it's often known in different parts of the world, is an excellent way of presenting um, mostly nymphs, more importantly, mostly weighted nymphs at short to medium ranges for trout and grayling. Uh, it's a fabulous way of getting dead drifts and that's what this is all about, is getting the perfect drift. We're essentially fishing a very, very long leader system here with little or no fly line. In fact, you'll be able to see on that reel there, all there is is backing and very long tapered leader. There's no fly line there. And the reason for that is the competition anglers worked out in the early and mid 90s that actually the worst thing, the biggest hindrance for a fly angler when we're talking about getting good drifts and good presentations to fish is fly line. It's thick, it's heavy, it gets dragged a lot by the currents. It's an absolute nightmare to manage. We have to mend it all the time. So what these competitions guys did is they came up with a system whereby they minimized or in some cases totally eliminated the need for any of that very thick fly line. And that's what makes it a deadly presentation. Now the French leader as it is today is probably slightly different to the way those early competition guys developed it, particularly in the UK. We use often very, very heavy flies with it. It's a fantastically versatile technique, but with that versatility comes different methods of using it. And I'm absolutely sure that through the course of watching these two videos, there'll be people, like, people out there who think, well, I do it differently to that, or I think I've got a better, better system than that. And that's absolutely fine. What I'm gonna show in these two videos is the method that I myself use and the method that I teach to my clients and if it works for some of you out there, great. If you feel like you've got a better method or a different method that works better, that's absolutely fine too. There's definitely more than one way of doing this effectively. So we have to look at what is a French leader? Well, a French leader is effectively a very, very long tapered leader. Um, and by very, very long, I'm talking about seven, eight or nine meters in some cases. I've actually got a 10 meter French leader in the bag, which I'm gonna use for today's video because it's bright red. The reason for that, as I say, is to eliminate the fly line. The reason for the taper, just like any other taper, is to enable us to get nice presentation and turnover. It's no different to a normal tapered leader that you put on the end of a fly line, apart from it's much longer. It is a technique that I predominantly use with nymphs, particularly weighted nymphs. Uh, it is possible to use it with much lighter teams of flies. In fact, if you get really good at it, it is possible to present dry flies with a French leader. It's not easy. I wouldn't suggest going out and doing it for your first time. But there are situations and certain times where, yeah, you absolutely can present a dry fly with one of these. I just wouldn't recommend getting started on the dry fly with a Frenchie because it's pretty hard work. So as you've probably already gathered from that first couple of minutes, this is a little bit different to your average fly fishing system. And because of that, it requires slightly different kit to your average fly fishing system. Uh, generally, the rods that we use for this are much longer than you'd expect to use on a small to medium river like this or even bigger rivers. The rod I've got with me today is a 10 foot two weight. It's quite an unusual rod. It's very, very long, much longer than most people would use on a river like this. And it's also quite light being a two weight. Obviously, since we're not using any fly line, actually that rating system is, is pretty nominal. It doesn't really matter. The reason I like the two weight and below is we've got quite a lot of grayling in this river and with them having very soft mouths, if we use something too stiff, it'd be quite easy to pull the hooks out. If I was fishing a bigger river, I have another rod that used for that. I've got an 11 and a half foot three weight. It's much longer, gives me much more control as we'll go through during the course of these two videos. But generally you'd want to fish slightly longer rods. I have tried this with shorter rods. I've attempted to do this with seven and eight foot rods. And while it is perfectly possible, it makes it pretty difficult. You end up with a pretty achy arm at the end of it. So if you're looking at getting into this, have a look at a 10 foot two weight, 10 foot three weight, maybe a 10 foot four weight at the most if you want something that you can do a bit of dry fly fishing with, but I certainly wouldn't go any heavier than a four with this. In terms of reels for this, I mean, essentially just like in any other form of trout fishing, the reel is pretty much just a line carrier, apart from obviously the difference with this one is it's not carrying any actual fly line. So in theory, any old reel that you've got will do. In fact, a lot of the time, what people do when the French leader fishing in the winter 
it's just wind that tapered leader, that very long French leader, over the top of the normal fly line and then you're away and that's absolutely fine. The reel probably looks a little bit big for the type of fishing I'm doing and in truth it absolutely is. It's got a very very large arbor and I really like that for when I'm using these uh, long monofilament uh, French leaders. Um, maybe that wouldn't make such a difference if we were using maybe the fly line style leader systems that are competition legal or if we were using perhaps braid like some of the guys do because it is possible to do this with very thin braid as well but because I'm using these monofilament leaders and at the back end they're a little bit thicker they can carry a bit of memory I like that large arbor. The other reason I like to use the bigger reel is because actually it balances my rig out absolutely perfectly if the reel was lighter it wouldn't balance that well and that's going to be super important going forwards because there are going to be times with this where you have to stretch your arm out where you have to really reach to make casts and with this rig you can see there I don't actually I can hold this at a full arm's length here and not actually have to grip the rod if this wasn't balanced and the tip was tipping down like that I'd have to close my hand around it and that puts a lot of pressure on my wrist it means I have to tense my forearm I'm going to tire out a lot faster if I've got to grip this hard to keep it balanced whereas because that reel balances the outfit off perfectly I can basically just balance it on my hand and I haven't got to close my arm sorry I'm going to close my hand but I've still got full control over what that outfit's doing really really important I would advise people not to go too light with a reel for this style of fishing the other thing about this reel and actually it probably relates to the weight a little bit is there is a drag system on here now obviously that adds a little bit of weight to the reel which as I've just said I think helps I don't think that's a bad thing but particularly when you first get going with a French leader unlike normal presentations upstream presentations where you retrieve in line to start with you won't be you'll basically be direct onto the reel when I started doing this I tried to do it with a reel with no drag system and I found that if I hooked a big fish it was a real pain because I had no control over the fish line poured everywhere it was a bit of a nightmare so if you're just getting into this I definitely recommend a drill a reel with a drag system the other point to note and it's not something that's absolutely essential to the system but it is something that bothered me in the past and I've spoken to a lot of people who all feel exactly the same about this one of the things I really like about this reel is that it's a full cage. Now to me that's really important because the amount of times during a day's fishing where if you didn't have a full cage that French leader will get underneath here just like a fly line can sometimes and then it's coming off the wrong side. Obviously with most reels that would mean that the French leader is going to get a little bit coarse up down here. Having that full cage means that that line always comes out of the front of the reel. It's a very small thing but when you're first getting into this you may well find with some reels, particularly cheaper reels, if you haven't got that full cage it gets caught around the back of the reel an awful lot. It drove me bonkers to start with, just like that beading. So that's rod and reel sorted. I guess the next bit to point out here is what's actually on the reel. And you'll notice there's two colours of back in there. I'll be honest with it. It's because when we were getting ready to film this video, I ran out. <laughs> I ran out of both balls of back in, so I've had to. I've had to join them. There's about 150 yards on there. There's plenty. I wouldn't usually have that, but I was kind of my hand was forced this time. So I've got about 150 yards of back in on there and no fly line. And all I've done is I've blood knotted the back end of my tapered leader, of the French leader, to the back end. As I say, the French leader is about 9 or 10 metres long. It's highly unlikely, very unusual that, that thing's going to go out of the tip ring. But just make sure when you're attaching it to your back end that you've fixed it securely. You might want to use a braided loop, you might want to push it up inside the back end. Whatever method you use for attaching your French leader to your back end, make sure it's secure just in case it ends up going through the tip ring. Right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get this rod rigged up. I'm going to change this. I've got a really nice bright French leader that you guys will be able to see easier on the video. So I'm going to change the French leader on here. I'm going to get it rigged up, rigged up, and I'm going to explain what happens at the business end of this system. Right, so that's my rod, reel, and French leader all rigged up and ready to go. What we need to do now is put something on the end of this. Now for these styles of urine infant we use some sort of indicator, we're using a visual reference here to try and spot the bites and there's loads of different indicators on the market. I'll be honest, most of them are pretty good. Uh, some of them will work different ways for different people. Braided mono type things with a couple of tippet rings on each end, nice and bright, they're absolutely great. Uh, I use something very very similar to that which has a piece of foam in the middle which means the light can't pass through it which makes it really easy for my clients to spot. Uh, you've got little spiral indicators made out of monofilament. You can use specialist indicator monofilament. It's got different colours on it. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways of doing this. Actually, my favourite way at the moment 
has been using waxes that you actually just draw on to your French leader rather than having to attach a physical thing I can just draw these waxes on and off and they make a huge difference particularly when you're in situations where you're having to change depths regularly from pool to pool. One thing we'll say about the waxes is they're not always that easy to see so I don't generally use those with clients and for that reason we're going to use the ones with the foam insert. I just find these the easiest to see. We'll take a moment now to say that all the stuff I'm talking about here is linked in the description below. So if you want to go through any of the stuff I've talked about in terms of the kit and have a look and check it out, have a look in the description box. You'll find loads of links to different stuff. Right, so what I need to do now is attach the indicator to the French leader. And with these, it's really simple because they've got a tippet wing on each end. So all I need to do is clean the line off the previous French leader off there. And I'm just going to use a normal clinch knot to tie this straight on. So that's my indicator attached to the French leader and ready to go. So from there, what we do is we attach the first section of tippet. This is one of the only bits of the whole system that I actually ever change. Now this first length of tippet will go from here to the first tippet ring, the first dropper essentially that we're going to use because we're going to use a team of two today. I always make this to about the length of the deepest pool I'd expect to fish during that day's fishing. On here, on the middle dove, that could be five foot. So this piece here will be about five feet. If we were on the upper dove or on a much smaller stream, that might only be three feet. If I was fishing the Welsh D in the middle of winter, that might be eight or nine feet. So this is my variable. This is the bit that will change from river to river. But usually during the course of a day's fishing, you wouldn't want to have to adjust this too much. You'd want to have this set for the day. Now in terms of breaking strain at this point, in truth, for the vast majority of my UK river fly fishing, I only ever carry three breaking strains of fluorocarbon with me. I carry some 5X, which is about five pound, some 6X, which is about three and a half pound, and some 7X, which is about two and a half pound. And to be honest, for almost all the fishing I do in the UK, I don't need any more or any less than that. I'm always amazed when I see people carrying like eight or nine spools of tippet with them. I just can't see the need for it. So from here, I'm going to attach a five foot length of 5x2. Just less than arm span. My arm span's about six feet, so just less than my arm span. That'll do. Excuse the teeth. I can't see any reason why I should have to change that for the majority of the day. Next thing I do with this is attach a tippet ring to it. Now, this is another one of those variables. Some people don't like the tippet rings. They'd rather use dropper knots or there's all kinds of different ways of doing this. Personally, I prefer the tippet rings. I find it really versatile. I find it much quicker to change things if I need to. I really like using these little tippet rings and they don't, for me, they don't detract anything from the presentation of the system. So I always stick with these. Okay, so not massively visible from that main camera, I imagine. But on the end of this 5x, round about five pound tippet of about five feet, I've attached a two mil tippet ring. And off there, I'm going to tie both my point fly and my dropper. The point fly is going to be about 18 inches in length. The dropper is going to be about six inches in length. And we'll talk more about the flies once I've put them on. Okay, so again, perhaps not massively clear from the main camera, but off of that tippet ring, we've tied between 18 inches and about two feet of 6x, three and a half pound. It's going to go down to the point fly and then between six and eight inches of the same breaking strain of line that's going to make up our dropper. At this point, these are both the same strength. So all we need to do now is pop a couple of flies on. So we'll talk about that next. Okay, so flies. Now, for me, this is one of the big minefields, uh, not only of this style of fishing, but most styles of fly fishing. I'll be honest with you, I often think most people way overthink flies particularly nymphs and particularly in rivers there's a whole box of nymphs there and that is my own box and it's my guiding box this is basically as far as trout fishing goes all the nymphs i use and it looks like quite a lot there there's probably nigh on 100 flies in there but if we really nailed this box down we could get rid of the top row because they're very very heavy point flies for fishing the french leader and that's something we're going to talk about in a little while we can actually get rid of those bottom two rows because they're spiders they're for a totally different style of fishing so if we just take these guys here in terms of what we're imitating we've got one two three four five six seven rows of different weights colors and sizes of flies that all imitate olives in some shape or form olive nymphs and then we've got one two three four rows of flies that all imitate caddis nymphs in some shape or form so in this whole box essentially i'm only actually imitating two flies and for me that's really important 
wherever you go in the UK, whatever river you're in, the predominant species of nymphs that you'll find when you flip over rocks will be olive nymphs of different types, your betis, uh, heptagenid, stuff like that. I don't want to go into too much detail with stuff like that. And you'll find caddis nymphs, so hydropsyche, uh, rhicophylla, uh, you know, your different types of case caddis, horn caddis, free swimmers, but they will be the predominant species. I can almost guarantee it. Some rivers will have a few more stoneflies, but as a rule, if you've got enough flies in your box in different weights and sizes that nicely imitate a couple of olive nymphs and that nicely imitate a couple of caddis nymphs, you're pretty much done. There's a little caveat of six flies down here which imitate freshwater shrimps. Now these days this river doesn't have as many freshwater shrimps in as it used to and that might be a pattern across the UK perhaps because of water quality. So if you're fishing a chalk stream and you want to fish this method maybe you'd have a few more of those shrimpy styles but actually in here we find they're not as useful as they used to be so we stick to the olives and the caddis. As I already talked about today we're going to use two flies. Now it's not always the case if we were fishing here in the dead of winter and it was a little bit higher and we were specifically targeting grayling I'd probably fish a third fly I'd have a very heavy point fly which would essentially be a sacrificial weight to get the other two droppers down. At this time of year when the water is a little bit lower perhaps a little bit warmer and we're targeting trout I've got no qualms about fishing too because trout generally will move further to eat a bug than grayling will. So two flies at this time of year is absolutely fine. I've found almost zero cases where having the point fly as the heaviest fly isn't the right thing to do. Again, sometimes in the dead of winter, actually, I might move that heaviest fly to the top dropper, which will totally drag the other two flies down onto the deck. But that's on days when it's very, very, very hard. Generally, the point fly on the point being the heaviest fly is the right way to go. So with that in mind and having discussed the type of bugs we'd expect to find in a freestone river like this, I'm going to rig myself up with a hedge bet. I'm going to use one nymph, possibly a Czech style nymph that imitates a caddis. And I'm going to put on one nymph, possibly one of these quill jigs maybe, that imitates an olive. And that means that whatever these fish are specifically targeting, if they are specifically targeting something, I'll have roughly imitated it and I expect us to get takes on that. Let's get rigged up. Okay, so we've talked about what the French leader is. We've talked about the type of kit we'd need to make it work. We've talked about the kind of flies. I guess what we need to talk about now is where, you know, where is this relevant? Where would you use this ahead of other rigs? Now, one of the great things about this style of fishing is it is incredibly versatile. I mean, you can fish this in very fast riffly water, like the stuff I've got behind me. You can fish it in quite slow bubble lines. Uh, you can fish it in deeper water if there's a bit of movement. It works pretty much everywhere. It can be easier or harder though in different types of water. So the one I tend to avoid with this rig is the very, very slow glassy stuff for two reasons first off it's very hard to control particularly getting the weight of flies right second is I find that those areas aren't really the type of areas where fish tend to stack up a nymph anyway but it's not often you'd associate very slow glassy canal like pools with nymph and fish so they're the only types of water I tend to avoid one of the absolute keys whatever type of water you're in and I'll talk about this more as we go through these two videos is the weight of the flies. Now, what we want here is a, a pair of flies or a team of flies that are heavy enough for us to get down quickly and get fish in efficiently as, almost as soon as those flies land, but light enough that they're not constantly getting snagged upon the bottom. So if you're fishing in any area and you find you're hitting the bottom too much, you know, you're getting false indications, your flies are too heavy, change them. By the same token, if you're fishing in an area and you're not hitting the bottom, if you're not getting those false indications, then the chances are you're fishing a bit too light. And I've found that what makes this most effective is if you're really proactive. I know a lot of my clients will say to me, crikey Andy, we've made a lot of fly changes in the last half an hour. And that will be because we're moving around or because the flies aren't hitting the bottom. So always be conscious when you're fishing this technique that ideally you want to get those flies as low as possible, particularly in the winter for grayling. Now, obviously, it's not winter right now. It's midsummer. It's probably not a time of year that most people would associate with great nymphing. But actually, this is one of the techniques that I use to get us out of trouble during the daytime. We know at this time of year, the vast majority of the fly activity is in the evenings, going towards the end of the day when it gets a bit darker. They're the times of day when you'd expect to find the most fish activity. But in my opinion, those fish haven't stopped feeding during the day. They're just feeding differently. The likelihood is when these rivers are low, when the water's a bit warmer, and when food is a bit more scarce, those fish are sitting in shallower, more oxygenated water, where there's a good amount of oxygen around the gills, they're getting lots of energy, and they're sitting in areas where there are bugs coming down. So we're looking for those foam lines. We'll talk about that more when we get in the river. 
So we've got a really interesting piece of water in front of us, which starts off very shallow, no more than about six or eight inches deep, and then gradually throughout its flow down here, through about 30 or 40 yards, drops off to about seven or eight feet. Now for nymph and fish, I really like to look out for those very steady drops, particularly over quite gravelly water, which this is. This is generally a pretty productive pool. I have a good feeling there's gonna be a few in here. As far as the French leader tactic goes, if we look at it very closely, we can see we've got a main flow line that actually comes down just over a rod length past me. And that's really important because given the conditions that we've already talked about with the river being quite low with these uh, fish looking for oxygenated water, that's exactly where I'd expect to see them. The other reason I like that is because it's pretty much channeled all the foam line from the river through this one area. Now, I think it was John Tyzak that said in a, a, a DVD a few years back that I watched, he had the same foam food fish. And I think that's absolute genius. That's perfect. Always on a river, you'll have a foam line where the white bubbles are. Often they'll be channeled into their own little area. They'll have one area they come down the river. And that's because they're pretty weightless. They're totally at the mercy of wherever the river wants to push them. In the same way that the bubbles are weightless, so are most of the bugs that get pushed into the river. They're all pretty weightless, they're all pretty helpless. So it's a pretty safe bet that any food that's loose and coming down the river is being channeled in the same kind of way. Which means that if you can find the foam, the chances are you've found where most of the food is. Now in conditions like this where there aren't fish rising and they haven't gone into the slacks, if you've found where most of the subsurface food is, it's a pretty safe bet that you've found where most of the feed and fish will be laid up because that's where all the food's coming down. So to start with, we're going to focus on the foam line in this pool. It does spread out a little bit. It's not impossible that I'll find fish in different parts of this pool, but to start with, I just want to focus on this inside section. So we'll crack on with that. Okay, so say done, because even though we're not fly casting in the traditional sense of it, we are still winging around heavy nymphs, so still important you've got some eye protection. And to start with, all I want to do is go through a very, very basic presentation with you guys. Now, before I throw any line, I do want to say that this is a predominantly upstream technique that does have some downstream benefits. So try and face yourself facing slightly upstream if you can. I know it's not always possible in some rivers, but if you can get yourself facing slightly upstream, it makes things a little bit easier. The first thing I'm going to do actually is wing these nymphs downstream of me, roughly where they'd be at the end of the previous drift. So I'm going to throw those down there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag these round the back of me a little bit, and I'm just going to flip them up into this riffle. And then I'm going to lift that indicator up out of the water. I'm going to track through with the rod ahead of the indicator and the indicator ahead of the flies. And what I'm watching for is that indicator ticking or bouncing and stuff like that. And that means the flies are on the bottom. If you're not seeing any ticking or bouncing or if the indicator just glides through easy as you like, the chances are that you're possibly not fishing heavy enough flies and perhaps you need to have a look at that point fly again. If that indicator is ticking but moving through nicely, it means the weight you've got there is pretty good. So let's try that one again. I'll drag those behind me, flip them up and across. I'm going to lift that indicator just out the water. I'm going to keep the rod ahead of the indicator and the indicator ahead of the flies and they're bouncing along nicely. Still going. Oh, that stopped there. That may or may not have shown up on the camera, but actually that indicator stopped totally. Now that tells us that something has intercepted the drift of those flies. The chances are at that point it was a rock. On any other cast, it could be a fish. So in that instance, you've got a strike. Let's go again. Up and across, lift the indicator slightly. Those are ticking along nicely. Little stop then, so I had to strike. You've got to strike those. I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move a couple of steps downstream See if I can find some slightly deeper water because I think my flies are possibly a wee bit heavy for this very shallow water. This is shallower than I expected. And see if we can pick up a fish that's a bit further off the ledge. So you're probably already getting an idea. This is a pretty active way of fishing. It's fairly non-stop. Oh, little jag then. Possibly was a little bit trigger happy there. Could probably have left that one, but you never know. You're better off striking than not in this situation always. That's ticking the bottom beautifully at that. That's absolutely perfect. That stops. Gotta strike those. Possibly a fish. Again, upstream, you can see here, I've got my arm outstretched a little bit now because I've actually gone a little bit further across the river with that cast. So to control it, rather than staying in here and letting it swing, by getting my arm out, I actually keep that indicator pointing directly upstream and everything's dead drifting. That's ticking down nicely. Uh, that's lovely. Still going, that's stopped. Every now and again when you're doing this, just check your nymphs because they could well pick up little bits of weed and stuff. And ex that's exactly the case here. I've got two nymphs here that both a little bit gunked up. So we'll um, get those both cleaned off. Let's go again. Again, I've made that slightly further across than I meant, but just by leaning across a little bit, 
I can still control them. And this is where that balance between the rod and the reel really comes in because I haven't got to grip that rod really hard. That stopped nicely. You'll have noticed when I'm striking, I'm striking low and downstream. You have to remember these fish are sat facing pretty much directly upstream. And if I strike upstream, there's a risk of me pulling the fly straight out the front of his mouth. Whereas by striking this way, you generally pin them in the scissors exactly where you want to hook them. That's stopped. There's a fish. There we go. That didn't take long. Oh, good fish as well. Good fish. Okay. So while we've got this fish on, I'm going to try my best. If I don't panic too much, I'm going to try my best to talk about how I like to play fish with these rigs. There are a few stockers in this river and I have a feeling from the looks of that, this is probably one of them. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. It's an absolutely giant stocky. So I prefer to play fish with this rig with the rod down here to the side. It's a very natural thing and I've seen a lot of anglers do it. They hook a fish like this and their first instinct is to do this with the rod and pull it upstream. Now my problem with that is that in this position, I'm now pulling against the full weight of that fish and the entire flow of the river. I actually think it's quite a bad position to play a fish from. Whereas from down here, you're actually pulling it away from that fast water. I think you're actually pulling it into an easier place to play the fish. He's going to want to stay out there because there's more oxygen in that riffly stuff. This could be a real long fight. This is a really big, really big stocky. Obviously we're using quite light tippets. We're only just over three pounds, but one of the advantages of these very soft rods is that they can cushion those tippets nicely. I've probably put the kiss of death on myself now. You wait, this will snap me off. But just by keeping the rod low down here, I've already drawn what is a really big fish over to my side of the river. Nice low rod. I think the worst thing you can do with these long rods is really move the rod around lots because every time you move the rod, you leave her in that hook. You just move in the hook and eventually you're risking hook pulls. This is a really strong fish. This is where that drag system comes in quite handy with, with this style of fishing is that often you'll end up playing fish directly off the reel. So having a quality drag system is a real advantage. With these bigger fish, one, thing, one piece of advice I would give you is unless you're winding, try and keep your hands away from the reel because these things can turn in an instant. I've seen it time and time again with clients where people have wound a little bit in and just left their hand on the handle there and then that fish has torn off just like that. And it's been the difference between landing that fish or breaking it off. I've seen a lot of fish broken off just by people leaving their hand on the reel a little bit too long. Ooh, you see, I nearly got myself in trouble there. I, <laughs> exactly what I just said. I nearly got it wrong myself. I just kept my hand on the reel a bit too long and actually put myself in real danger of losing that fish. Fortunately, I got away with it this time. So at this point, I'm going to have to switch the line, the rod, because that fish has now gone towards the big tree down there. So at this point, I really have no choice but to try and guide him away from that. But once he's back out into the open water, I'll probably take a couple of steps back upstream. I'm just going to knock that drag up slightly. Take a couple of steps back upstream and I'm going to switch the rod back over to the side it was on before. There we go. Always happiest in this position. I'd far rather play a fish from here than any other position. So we're staying nice and relaxed. This fish has taken two or three good runs off me already and it looks like he's just about to get charged up to go again. But the last thing I want to do at this point is panic. I know I've got an outfit that's nicely balanced. I know the rod is going to soak up most of the lunges. I now know that the drag system is set about right, that in theory it should give line before the line snaps. So unless something particularly drastic goes wrong at the far end, there really is no reason why I should get snapped off by this fish. See, they've almost got the indicator back to the, back to the tip. I don't want to wind any more than that. There he is. Just, just, just freaked him out a little bit with that water being shallow. So just getting him towards the edge of the flow line again, but he doesn't want to come into this shallow stuff. Two reasons, obviously shallower water and stiller water is unsafe for a fish and they know that. Secondly, because it's got less oxygen in it, but by just applying this steady pressure, I'm not pulling as hard as I can, but just steady pressure on this fish. I'm just going to switch that rod around. There we go, turned him away from that snag. Just by applying some steady pressure to this fish and not panicking, we've actually taken it exactly where we want it. He's still capable of taking line. He's definitely not ready to land yet. I'm just going to switch that rod back over here now. I've turned him then. It's the first time I've turned this fish properly. Okay, he's wallowed a little bit. So what I'm going to do, just applying a pressure slightly higher than I was before. I just want to see how this fish reacts to being higher in the water. If he really goes, then we'll, we'll drop the rod back to how it was before. But for the moment, I'm going to keep this rod a little bit higher now. I want to see if I can turn him or beat him or just try and get a, a couple of wins feels like this fish might be getting a little bit closer he's turned again 
It's huge. It's an absolutely enormous fish. It barely even fits in the net it's that big. I have no idea why people are stocking fish that big into rivers. Um, but what it has given us is a great example of how we can play big fish on very light kit as long as it's balanced. Let's have a look at this thing and get it straight back. I can practically feel the hate emanating through the camera as we speak. Don't get me wrong, I would far, far rather that these rivers were full of pristine wild fish. I can't fathom why someone would want to stock a, a fish of this size into a river. It's actually a blue trout. I don't know why you'd want to put these things into a river. I guess in this instance, what it has done is given a good opportunity to show you how this rig works and how capable these lighter rods are of landing big fish. As long as you do the right things, and I think particularly staying relaxed and keeping that rod low and pulling fish away from the major flow line is the easiest way to tame a big fish like this. We'll get him in hooks, we'll get him chucked back, and hopefully the next fish we catch won't be quite this weird. This is massive. So he took that caddis nymph. Oh dear. Just look at the size of that. That is absolutely outrageous. It's huge. I mean, that must be four or five pounds. As I say, I am totally against fish of this, like, this size being stocked in these rivers. That said, I am going to slip him back. I'm a catch and release angler, so he's going to go back. A fish this size probably won't last more than 12 months in the river anyway. Go on, buddy. Go and get big. Oh, nice. <laughs> Don't get any bigger, though. You're too big already. So, yeah, as I say, not my kind of fish. I'd far rather these were wild browns, but a great example of how we can tame big fish using this very light kit if we use it properly. Let's get back in the river and let get, get back to the technical stuff. Okay, so we'll go again. I'm going to pull off about a rod and a half length's worth of line, no more than that. That'll do us to start with. And again, I'm going to face myself slightly upstream. I'm going to flick the rod, the flies, upstream and across. I'm going to lift the indicator just above the surface and I'm going to track downstream with the rod ahead of the indicator. Oh, that stopped. Rod ahead of the indicator and the indicator ahead of the flies. And that's super important because if I haven't got that angle, if I'm not ahead of those flies, then I can't, I've got no contact with the point fly and that's really important. I want to be in contact with that point fly without affecting it too much. And if I have the rod behind the flies or behind the indicator, I don't really know what's happening there. Oh, I've gone a bit further across, so again, I'll stretch out a little bit because of how well the outfit's balanced. I can stretch and do this all day without being too uncomfortable. That's going through really nicely. If anything, at this point, I'm possibly too light on that point fly. And the drift, oh, that stopped. I had to lower the rod then. So actually, I think I'm too light on the point fly. I've got a little rule that I kind of stick to here with regards to figuring out whether or not I'm getting down in time. Now, obviously, the most efficient time for this rig is when those flies are down on the bottom and fishing. So what I tend to do is I tend to split my drift into quarters. So where the flies land, just there, is the first quarter. Where the drift ends there is the last quarter. So between there, I've got four quarters. At the end of the first quarter, if those flies aren't down and fishing, then in my eyes, I'm not getting down fast enough. I need more weight than that. So first quarter is the drop, the flies falling through the water. Middle two quarters are where the flies fishing. That's where I'm expecting to get the majority of my takes. The final quarter is when those flies are swinging. It can be a good time to get takes, and in the second video, we're gonna talk about ways we can induce a take at that point. But usually, you'd expect to get most of your takes in that middle two quarters of the drift. I'll we'll just give this one more, and we'll talk about that. So they're in. And if they're not showing that signs of being down by about now, which they haven't, They've just touched down now, so I'd say that's probably a third of the drift. It's pretty close, but for me, it's not enough. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that point fly for a similar pattern, but something slightly heavier, and make sure we're down a little bit faster. Okay, so I have changed that point fly. I've not gone for something drastically bigger. I've only gone for a bead size of about an extra half a millimetre. I don't think there's any need more for me to throw something really heavy here, because this water in front of me is probably only 18 inches deep. I just want something that's going to get me down slightly faster than the other one was. Even though it's only half a millimetre, I can already feel from the cast that it's different, and that's already down now. There we go. So yeah, that's hit the deck much quicker. So that's, uh, in my rule there of 
the first quarter is sinking and the second quarter it needs to be down, that is absolutely fine. That's down. That stops and it must have been the bottom again. So it's at this point where possibly if I was just here to catch every single fish in the river, I'd go through a couple of fly changes possibly because these fish have seen these flies quite a few times. Um, possibly I'd try and get a little bit further downstream. But the area I want to have a look at just for the moment would probably be the last part of this pool of fish. Over on this far side, we've got a back eddy and there's a real heavy seam. A seam is an area where fast current meets slow. And we can see over here, there's a real heavy seam in this water. Now, often if fish aren't feeding or if they're only feeding very lightly, they'll sit in these areas because they can dip in and out of that fast water. So we'll take a couple of steps across the river. And let's just see if we can get a couple down this seam. I'm going to give it a big stretch on this one again because that's quite a long cast. It's going across the river. Just waiting for that thing to stop now. All oh, that wind's nasty. It's the absolute worst thing for the French leader is an upstream breeze. Okay, I'm low in the rod now just to keep those flies down for as long as I can. Little strike at the end and we go again. That's right on that seam, that's perfect. Indicator above the water. I've got the rod downstream of the indicator and the indicator is downstream of the flies, there's a fish. That was a lovely take, that's stopped absolutely dead, that's perfect. What have we got here? It doesn't feel quite as... Um, hefty as the last one. We'll say that, he's got his head down. Again, I've got this rod low, I've got it to the inside of me and immediately this has drawn the fish from the other side of the river right to me. I think this is a really effective way of playing fish. I'm far more comfortable with this than by having the rod pointing upstream. I'm not sure what this one is at the moment. I haven't really seen it. It's certainly come towards me faster. I think actually I can see it now. It's another one of those stockers. Crikey. So they've um, They've taken charge of this pool then, at the moment. So that's another one, it's the second one. It's not quite as big as the first one, but it's still a big fish. Again, great test of the kit, the very, very light kit. You wouldn't usually associate this light kit with landing fish of this size, but it's very, very doable, as long as you're patient and as long as it's balanced. Yeah, this guy's certainly got a better turn of pace than the last fish had, that's for sure. Taking some line. Oh, let's get him away from that tree. He's gone down there much earlier than the last one did. So I'm gonna apply a little bit of upwards pressure just to kind of confuse him out of there. That's it. I've got him back into that easier spot now. Now I can bring the rod back over to this inside bank. So again I've just lifted the rod slightly at this point. Just I'll be honest with you, I'm trying to I'm perhaps trying to bully this fish a bit more than a bit more than maybe I ought to, just to try and stun him into the net. Let's keep him away from that bank. This is the point now where I really have to apply some pressure but I haven't got my right hand on the line so I can apply that pressure pretty safe in the knowledge that if I overcook it, if I get something wrong myself, that reel's still going to give some line. It's still going to get me out of trouble. I've had this guy up for a while now. I don't know if he's ready yet. He's still a bit flashy, a bit splashy, but he is in the net. So interestingly, he's taken the fly that I just changed to, that slightly heavier pheasant tail, the, the olive nymph imitation. So clearly that, was a, clearly that was a good decision. That's worked for me. Just on the front of the mouth there again. Another stocky. Not what we came here to catch, but proves the point with regard to technique, that's for sure. There we go. Oh, cracky, that was aggressive. So yeah, as I say, not the not the kind of fish we want, but certainly the, the way we wanted to catch them by just going a bit further over the river, by stretching my arm out a little bit and by fishing water that's further, but fishing it effectively by keeping that rod tip and that indicator in line with each other and not pulling the flies around. I've got myself a take there from a piece of water that looked like it didn't have a whole lot going on. That's worked really nicely. Okay, so it was really nice to catch a couple of fish down there. We've got going now, we've, we've gone through the kit, we've gone through the initial technique, but what we had down there was ideal world scenarios, you know, I could make big casts off the normal shoulder, everything was as easy as it possibly gets. Now what we've actually done, the next part of this, the bit that's going to take us a step further, is we've crossed round to the other side of the river and we're going to fish towards the bank that we were stood on initially. Now that changes quite a few things unfortunately, it does mean that all of a sudden we've got to switch the way we make the casts, we've got to adjust quite a lot of things, but it's going to be a real help because the last thing you want to do if you get to a piece of river and you've only got single bank access is to be on the wrong side and not know how to handle this French leader. So we're going to jump in here, we've got a lovely little neck of a pool in, see if we can find a couple of those grayling. So you'll be able to see here there's a lovely neck of a pool here, it drops off really quick, it's nice fine gravel, it looks like the perfect spot for a grayling. But we've got to be really really careful that we don't spook these fish and we've got to be really careful that we make the right presentations and that starts with making these casts 
off the wrong shoulder. So I'm going to start this exactly the same way as we started when we were facing the right way around, and that's by throwing the flies downstream of me, directly downstream of me down there. Now they're organised. And basically what we're going to do is we're going to stand facing where we want the flies to go, just like we were before, slightly upstream. But this time I've got to make this cast off the backhand. And it's got to go up there. And then from there, what we do is we try and fish it. Ooh, a little tap. We try and fish it as similarly to how we were fishing before as possible. So that includes getting the indicator just off the surface of the water. It includes being downstream of the, ooh, downstream of the indicator with the rod tip and it includes the indicator being ahead of the flies because that keeps us in touch and we're waiting for that indicator to stop or twitch or do any weird stuff and we're going to strike downstream just as we were doing before apart from this time it's going to be across a body oh there's one there's one so we'll get him out of the pool because hopefully there'll be a few more see how the rod's pointing the other direction to how it was before but i'm still trying to pull this fish away from the main flow so we try and pull him across the river if at all possible. He's in quite fast water there. It's a much smaller fish than the ones we were catching before, but very welcome. In you come, buddy. Beautiful wild brownie. That's what we were after. Oh, the hook's out. There we go. So gorgeous little wild dove brownie. Let's slip you back. Oh, <laughs> there he goes. That didn't take long then, did it? It was a, clearly a good area. All the, all the water, all the food is being siphoned into one spot. So any fish that's willing to sit there and use a little bit of energy to nymph is going to find there's a lot of food coming past there. And by being able to make those casts off the backhand and throw them across my body rather than orthodox, it's given me a chance there of catching those fish that perhaps I wouldn't have had if I'd have been fishing conventionally. It would have been very, very hard to get those flies there. Okay, so we've only come another 20 30 yards down we see we've got a bit of a lay down here we've got a bit of a log jam that's caused a really nice flow line just in front of us here again looks like a great area to be able to throw a nymph so i'm going to drop this around here and see if we can winkle one out just up against these logs again we'll start with a rod and a half out the tip no more than that and stand myself facing upstream i'm just going to flop it into that kind of area get that indicator up it's much slower here than where we just fished and that's Oh, 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 no. Just throw those downstream, get it all straight. Ping those a bit further across into the pool, maybe. Indicate it just off the surface. It's in a good area. Still in touch with it. <laughs> There's actually a fish just risen up here. So let's see if we can, let's see if we can nymph him out. Okay. Indicators up. Little strike at the end of the drift, just in case, and we'll go again a bit further upstream. You need to be a bit careful in here because I know there's all kinds of nasty snags for him as you get caught on. Oh, that was a fish. That was possibly that fish we saw rise. Took it on the drop. Oh, that's one of those snags we were talking about. <laughs> that was inevitable. Oh yeah, that is a nasty one. I'm going to have to go and get that one. So we've just crept downstream, maybe 10 yards. I've seen the future up there. I think if I, keep, uh, if I keep throwing flies into that bit, eventually I'm going to start losing them. So we'll get back to that rod and a half length. Get my feet facing upstream. Make that cast up there. Indicator up. I think I can possibly squeeze that a bit further across the river. It seems to take an age to get to the bottom. I might have to go heavy with that point fly. Yeah, it takes a long time to get down. It must be really deep out there. Okay, so yeah, we're going to have to change that point fly again because that's not quite getting down fast enough. Righty, back at it with a slightly heavier nymph. I say slightly, it's, it's quite a lot heavier, but it really does drop quickly there. So off the backhand again. Keep that indicator just above the surface. And that's down. There we go. That's actually touching the bottom in the, in the run itself. There we go. feel a lot more comfortable with that, that's for sure. It's down in the pool. There we go. There's a fish. There's a fish. Right, so obviously slightly harder place to play a fish here and I'm totally in the flow line so really this one's about being as careful as I can guiding this fish over there we go there's another one in the net that's really cool so that's another one of those wild brownies and that came about as a result of a being able to make that cast off the backhand accurately in amongst all these nasty sticks and b just that fly change has got me down quicker it's got me on the bottom and it's no coincidence that within two or three drifts we've got a fish in the net no monster, but very welcome. I love these wild brownies. This is what it's all about. He took that olive nymph. Gorgeous little fish. Look at that. Absolute perfection. Away he goes. 
as I say, really cool. They're satisfying fish they are. When you have to go through the process of changing the fly and the cast is a bit more complicated, it's really, really satisfying. I'm super pleased with that one. So I think on that note, what we'll probably do actually is I think we're going to finish vlog one here because we've covered as much stuff as I wanted to. So let's just go and have a quick recap about what we've talked about so far, the really important bits and the stuff that you're going to work on if you want to get proficient at using the French leader. So there we go, a gentle introduction to the world of Euro nymphing or fishing the French leader. It's a bit of a minefield for a few different reasons, but if you stick to a few basic principles, actually it can be really effective and not that hard to learn. It's one of the methods I like to teach people who haven't held a fishing rod before. Before we start doing the casting in the field and the tick-tock and all that stuff, let's just get out with the French leader, let's catch, catch a couple of fish, get used to the kick, get used to how it works, and it gives you a really good foundation. So if you've never held a fly rod before, this could be the best way to get into it. All you have to do is remember a few really key fundamentals. They're stuff that I think makes this work better. To start with, try and get the rod tip ahead of the indicator in the flies. It will keep you in touch a little bit better. It will make seeing those takes a little bit easier. Also try and make sure the flies are drifting through the same line as the current's trying to take them. If you're dragging those flies around all over the place, it looks unnatural. Sure, you'll probably catch a few fish, but I don't think you'll fish it as effectively as if you're drifting these flies in the same direction, in the same places as the current. You'll find that the more across the river you want to make the casts, the more behind you you'll need to pull the flies. So keep that in mind. This always wants to work in 180 degrees. If I want to cast there, I need to get the flies roughly 180 degrees of there. That's really important. It makes it a lot easier to reposition. And remember, if you are repositioning the flies, if you are going further across the river, don't be lazy with it. Get that arm out there. Get stretching because it'll fish more effectively. You can cut out on the drag. You can cut out on the nasty drifts. You can catch more fish. I promise you it's the way to go. So that about wraps it up for part one of this two-part series. As I say, the second part is coming, so please stick around. It'll be no more than a few days. Hopefully within a week, we'll have part two. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so you see it coming, so you get the notification. Uh, press the little bell button, that way you'll keep in touch with me and IB. And if you haven't done this before, drop me some comments in the, in the comments section. Let me know what you think. Have I explained it well enough? Is there some stuff that's been left behind? If I can help with anything, let me know in the comments section. If you have fished the Frenchie before, if you have done some urine infant before, again, get in touch. Is there anything here that you don't do? Is there anything you've done differently to this? Totally open book. Please do let us know. For the meantime, all I need to say is thank you very much to you guys for watching. A huge thank you to IB for being behind the camera all day helping film this one. She's, <laughs> I think IB wants a glass of Prosecco. She's been absolutely amazing. A huge help. She's a really good videographer. I'm very, very grateful. Guys, thank you for watching. I'll see you all again very, very soon for part two of How to Fish the French Leader or the Euronymph. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.